Hi everyone, welcome to another installment of our live stream more virtual monthly tour series. Today we had the pleasure of exploring the Neon Vancouver, Ugly Vancouver uh, exhibition with civic historian, author, and heritage consultant John Atkin. My name is Berenger and I will be your host this evening. So before we get started, I would like to point out a few housekeeping things. Uh, should you have any question or comments throughout the tour, feel free to use the chat button below. Um, we will be monitoring the chat throughout. So there will be also an opportunity for a 10 minute um, question and answer session at the end of the tour. Additionally, we have recently uh, incorporated live closed captioning for all our online events um, as a means to improve and increase our accessibility for our community members. So keep in mind, uh, the AI technology may not be 100% accurate uh, for some words, uh, including place names and specific terminologies. So we appreciate uh, your understanding. Lastly, we would like to acknowledge that the Museum of Vancouver is located within the unceded ancestral territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. And before I pass it over to John and Dustin in the gallery, I would like to point out that John is not wearing a mask today for this tour for accessibility reasons. So we are currently close to the public, our cameraman, Dustin Clark is wearing a mask and John and Dustin will stay six feet apart throughout the tour. So we take COVID-19 uh, protocols seriously and we want to make sure that you know uh, that we are taking all precautions to keep our staff safe. So now without further uh, ado, uh, over to you John. Uh, thank you and uh, welcome everyone. Uh, it is my pleasure uh, to be able to be here this evening and, uh, for me, revisit some of the neon signs in the collection. Uh, we're entrance here, the Neon Vancouver, Ugly Vancouver, and we'll explain uh, the sort of dual nature of that title as we walk through the exhibition. And uh, it's really fun for me to come back here because uh, back in 2019 or so, uh, I was the curator for the original Neon exhibit. And so many of the signs that we have here tonight we're in that show. It's been supplemented by other signs that the museum has collected. And I think that's one thing to note is that for a public institution, the Vancouver Museum, or sorry, Museum of Vancouver, uh, is actually a proactive collector of these things. And so they have a list of signs that they would like to collect. And uh, there have been new, new pieces added to the collection uh, over the years. And it is one of the largest collections of neon signs in a public institution. So with that, let's go take a look at the gallery and let's look at some neon signs. One of the things that uh, I think we should start with is the wall here underneath our We Deliver sign for Owl Drugs. Uh, this was a sign out on 41st Avenue, I believe. Uh, but one of the things about neon is it's a gas and neon is one of the gases, argon, Xeon and Krypton are some of the other ones. Uh, you can also use a variety of ones that are all distilled from oxygen. So essentially, as you're sitting there watching this home, you're breathing all of the gases that make neon signs possible. Uh, neon, which is ni for new, uh, was actually the first of the gases to be distilled and isolated. And so it gives you the characteristic red or orange color that you'll see through the exhibit and certainly up in the parcel in the feet and the kilt of our owl above us. And then argon is the other major color and that's the blue. And you'll see that on his uh, vest and up in the hat. Now the blue, if you were to just use pure argon, all you'd get is this incredibly dull gray. And uh, so what you do is you add a pinch of mercury to the tube just before you seal it and pump it. And that gives the characteristic blue color. And then uh, Xeon, Krypton or uh, light purples and various things like that. And there's some other gases that you use as well. But neon and argon are the two that really give you the big punch, I guess. Um, because what you can do with the colors 
is pure red, as in the uh, owl here, or the blue uh, and things, or what you do is you add a phosphor and then the electricity makes that phosphor glow. And depending on the phosphor you have in the gas, you can change colors. And so you can create a huge range of colors with just the two gases. And uh, once you combine different color of glass, different phosphor, et cetera, you've got a range of hundreds of colors to actually play with, with neon. The other thing to point out is how a sign bender makes a sign. And one of my favorite artifacts in this exhibit, uh, and the museum has a few of these, are the plans for the sign. So we're standing here in front of Southgate Cleaners. And I, I really like this sign because our guy is rushing and his tie is flying and he's got his pink shirt. And in behind, we actually have the asbestos drawing for this sign. And so a glass blower is going to be taking this, rolling it out on the bench and he's got his tubes. And so basically you're going to plug one end of the tube. You've got your rubber tube in your mouth plugged onto the other end. And so you've got your burner and a, it's a rocker burner. So you're rocking it back and forth the tube. And so you're going to bend and soften up the glass, but you're blowing into it a constant pressure so that when you actually bend these curves and things like this, you don't crimp the tube. And so that way you don't crimp the gases and you get an even color all the way through. But how do you get the shape? Well, that's where your asbestos comes in. And so what you're doing is bending, putting it down on the asbestos, checking it, bending it, checking it. And the drawing of course is full scale. So you have to then bend everything at full scale and you're doing it in reverse. Now in some cases too, you can actually see the bender here has had to work with green yellow into the pink. And down here, the foot is green into blue. And the same thing up here, the green goes into the red with the tie. And so this is the glass bender's art here, because not only are you bending the shape, but you're now fusing the two tubes together. And if you get a really good bend, and we'll get Dustin to focus in right in here, you can actually see there's almost no break between that. You've got the same gas through here, argon, but you get a slight little hint of blue there. This is really, really good bending. And so this is a really great example of the two benders art because of all the different colors that are actually welded together to create the sign. And so that asbestos plan then is then kept at the sign company uh, because then if uh, something got broken, you'd unroll that and you'd be able to replace the elements. And so, uh, this is one of my favorite spots here, just because of the glass bending in the Southgate cleaner sign, but also just seeing the benders drawing uh, at full scale. So as we move through uh, the exhibit, one of the things that's kind of interesting too, is if you look closely at some of these signs, you can see uh, how metalwork was recycled. And one of the things that during the war, World War II, uh, sheet metal was actually not available for sign companies because of the war effort. And so many times what they would do is actually reuse the can. So the big metal piece here that in front of the Annette uh, Beauty Salon, uh, this is called the can. And so if we look at the Annette sign, what's interesting here, you can actually see that we have old two poles for the electrodes. And so that's been uh, closed up and then when you sort of squint at the backdrop here in the lights, you can actually see there's a whole other design in that circle. And so this was actually used for something else before Annette's uh, dress salon actually got the sign. And that's quite common because sign companies would take down the sign because they owned them. And we'll talk about why ownership was uh, so important to the history of neon signs in Vancouver. But the neon sign company owned the sign. So when the lease was over, they would take it back. And very often they would just take it apart and reuse the metalwork and things like that. The other thing too, that we see on the signs uh, is the nameplate. Now, some of them don't have the nameplates, but others do. And here on our other beauty salon, just tucked in here, we have a really nice David Neon plaque. And this is one of the companies that showed up in the 1930s. Now, the 
neon signs were patented, the technology for neon was patented by Georges Claude, he was the Frenchman who had made a living out of distilling the gases and also um, creating uh, liquid air. That was the company uh, for oxygen for hospitals and things. And so he patented the system. He made an absolute bomb off of licensing patents. Uh, and so it, you know, it cost you thousands and thousands of dollars in 1920 dollars. Uh, but the patent expired in 1932. And that's when we saw the burgeoning of neon companies in Vancouver. And so you had, I think, 12 or 13 companies in Vancouver bending glass and making neon. One of the things over here that's quite lovely are what we call table signs. And so we have not strictly a table sign, the Williams Piano House sign. This was a small piece that would have sat of the storefront on Granville Street. They had a much larger blade sign. That's a perpendicular sign that comes off the building uh, that reached the full height of the building and then probably a whole nother floor above it. Also in this uh, brilliant, just straight red uh, neon. But the other tabletops are kind of fun. And uh, the Star Weekly sign is quite lovely here because it's all self-contained in its own little can. It has some sort of Art Deco streamlined wooden feet to it. And this would sit up above the cashier. It might sit up on one of the shelves. And it was just to advertise the Star Weekly. Now, Star Weekly signs, I mean, for such a major publication that was published in Canada, they gave the signs away, both the tabletop ones like this and also the signs out in front of the store uh, as advertising. And so, so many uh, corner confectionaries and newspaper stalls, et cetera, just had a Star Weekly sign and then it was Bob's Candy underneath it. We have this Star Weekly sign. We have one on Commercial Drive. There should be one still in Sydney on Vancouver Island. And I think there's one other sign somewhere in British Columbia, but they are very, very rare. So it's nice to see such a, a clean example as this one. And then uh, the Palm Dairy sign is quite lovely too, because it again has its sort of streamlined feet. It's got the uh, pink neon, which is kind of nice. And you can see how the phosphor is starting to fade. This is quite old. The phosphor is fading so that we've got parts of the P, very bright pink, and then the rest of it where the neon gas is showing through because the phosphor is worn out. But that's just kind of nice. That's for a neon sign, the patina of age. And then we also have the glass piece underneath it with the ice cream on it. And so you get a nice little sort of play there. And then the painted can behind it as well. And then these were meant to be movable. The transformers inside the can, there's just a plug for the wall. So there's a handle on top, you could pick this up and move it around the store. And so this is also a really nice example. And so then we walk over this way. One of the signs, the newest ones that have come uh, to the collection is the Blue Eagle. Now this is the Blue Eagle Cafe that was on uh, Hastings Street, just between uh, Main Street and uh, Columbia Street. And it was on the south side of the street. It was actually one of the original white lunches, uh, which was this splendiferous tiled interior. And uh, the Blue Eagle took it over. And uh, I liked sitting there at the coffee counter. They had some fairly decent pies and reasonably good coffee. And uh, you'd sit there and you'd talk to some of the guys that came in and, and chatted about just the day's events and things like that. So when the cafe closed, it was really nice to see that this sign actually came to the museum. Now. What I like about this is it was collected off the street and brought to the museum and absolutely nothing was done to it. Now, some folks, conservators and things would be looking at this and the peeling paint, the broken tubes, the rust and everything else and would be like, ah, we need to clean this up, we need to fix this. But on the other hand, this is the condition that it came off the street in. Now, the contract for this had probably expired quite some time ago, there was very little maintenance on it. Uh, but this really shows how hard a life the sign actually has out on the street. And so just having it like this, I think, is really great. But also what it points out is how many different elements go into a sign. Because so often today what we see is a piece of neon on the street, and it's just a static piece of uh, glass that lights up. But here, this is meant to be seen in the daytime, so like this, unlit, but also at night, and it changes character. So what we actually have then is 
uh, the bands of neon behind the eagle, which are white. And then we have this piece of neon here that comes down and runs across the front. And there's one piece missing, and that's the arrow. And so that's got a clicker inside. And so it would trick the eye in thinking that the arrow moves. Because what we actually have is another tube, the straight tube that's laid across here. If you were to stand under the sign when it was in action, you'd actually hear the physical click. These were mechanical clickers. And so you get the long tube, flash off, the bendy tube, and then the straight tube. And so it looked like it's saying, here, go this way for pie and coffee. And the other thing too is really nice is the eagle. So this is painted wood and your sign painters were in Vancouver, certainly um, art school graduates and folks that really were quite talented artists. And so the painting of the eagle for the daytime and then outlined in uh, neon for the evening. And also as Dustin zooms in on the paintwork, you can see that there's many layers of paint uh, because all these signs were under contract. The neon companies own them, you lease them and you signed a maintenance agreement. And so many times uh, you had crews that basically traveled the city circuit, the provincial circuit and would show up, paint the sign, touch it up and uh, move on. And that's also what's fun about the signs is there's layers and layers of paint on these suckers. And so one of the delights and conflicts of the original neon exhibit was between the conservators and guys from neon products that came to repair the signs. The conservators, and, and I mean this with all due respect, um, were trying to hold the paint on. They were trying to conserve the curled paint. It was now, this is the condition, it's been a session, we need to keep it. The sign guys, when they started work on the signs, oh, okay, they would scrape the paint off of it, oh, get rid of that tube and things like that. And it was like, no, don't touch the sign. No, come on lady, we've got to fix it. And so, uh, signs were never static, they always changed. And so we've captured them at one part of their life, but they might have, you know, Southgate or uh, the Blue Eagle might have changed colors over many, many different years. One of the uh, series of pieces that we have here is the pink R from the Regent Taylor. And so that's the R. And then hanging off of the ceiling, we have another piece, which was the perpendicular sign that came off the building. Now, Regent Taylor, uh, Taylor's was on Hastings Street uh, near Victory Square. And they had a very theatrical uh, storefront because the building had this massive curved, almost theater-like piece that, that came up, uh, up to the top of the building. And so you had a, a huge perpendicular sign with arrows from the roof all the way down. So it kept flashing and pointing you at the storefront. And then there was a whole marquee piece and then the pink R with the rest of the region sat across there like a marquee. And so again, um, many times too, you would actually have signs added to the composition. Uh, so the Ovaltine Cafe down on Hastings Street uh, is interesting because we actually have the flashing O sign and the arrow for the Ovaltine. Uh, that's uh, when the cafe opened. And then later they put uh, a piece across the front and there's also some window neon. And so often you have signs from different eras uh, that are added to the existing storefronts. Now, Vancouver had so much neon, uh, it was actually known for its neon. Uh, so someone like myself that grew up in Victoria, it was a big deal when we came to Vancouver. And like every other small town folks, uh, my dad would, uh, you know, we'd be driving in Vancouver and we'd you know, go out in the evening because why? Well, we had to drive Hastings Street and we had to drive Granville Street. And Granville Street, like many theater uh, rows in North America, did get the nickname, the Great White Way. And you can see in photographs um, online and in this exhibit and elsewhere, just the layering of signage uh, on the street. And so it's a key sort of memory of of many of us, uh, just the signs on the street, not layering and layering and layering. And Vancouver at one point had, by an estimated uh, sign company uh, association uh, back in 1953, estimated there were close to 19,000 signs on Vancouver's streets. Not everyone else's in greater Vancouver, but just Vancouver. 
And so that was about one sign for every 18 residents. Now in 1953, they were celebrating neon. And that was one of the things that I think is so interesting. Through the 40s, the 50s, neon is celebrated. And in the 1930s, it was so interesting. You would see uh, advertisements for uh, businesses. And one of the ones was uh, Dominion Motors. And they were unveiling their new neon sign. And so there were full page adverts and they invited the public to come down and the police would have to close the street because people wanted to gather to watch the signs being lit. And so these were quite the events. Fast forward into the 1950s and you get um, 53, a huge celebration of Vancouver's neon glory. The newspaper articles are just raving about the extraordinary neon. And then you get to 58 and suddenly well, there's a whole bunch of reasons why uh, suddenly neon falls out of favor. But one of the things that happens is the post-war period in North America and in the United States, really, uh, where you see the move from the city center out to the suburbs. Now, there's a whole uh, concern around uh, returning soldiers and families in cramped inner city neighborhoods and, and things. And so going to the suburb was seen as a good thing. But as business moved to the shopping malls, as people moved out, certainly in American cities, what you had were signs hanging on empty storefronts. Now, in the United States and elsewhere, neon signs are owned by business. In Canada, they're owned by the sign company. So what you had then was this very quick shift from, wow, look at the light and the elegance of Broadway and, and various things like that, to neon becoming a very easy trope for decay. If you wanted to show someone down on their luck in the 1960s in a movie, you put them in a t-shirt, actually an undershirt, uh, and you sat them in a hotel room and the neon sign just behind the curtains blinking on and off. And you knew the guy was just about on his last legs. And so neon then became associated with urban decay. And then unfortunately it became became the idea that neon causes urban decay. And then one silly uh, counselor in Vancouver decided that neon actually would cause the prostitution problem as well as the litter problem. And so we got to get rid of the stuff. And that is a whole arc now of let's get rid of neon. It's ugly, hence the neon ugly. And there was a conflict with the city. It was around, we want to see the mountains, not the city. And uh, one commentator on CBC television uh, sitting there on the desk with his pipe, he sits there, you know, that Vancouver can be a beautiful city. The city shouldn't be in nature. Nature should be in the city. And that's the idea that we shouldn't be an urban space. We should be sort of allowing, I guess, the mountains to come in into the city. But that really is this whole period of getting rid of neon, getting rid of signage in general, and a really anti-urban sort of bent in the city of Vancouver. And so our 1974 sign bylaw uh, was a really draconian document. And what it said was no signs above the roof line, no signs could spin. They outlawed most perpendicular advertising. So, you know, if you're driving down, let's say Kingsway and you're wondering why is this person driving so badly? Well, they're trying to find the business, but they can't see because the sign doesn't hang out over the sidewalk. Um, but anyway, the sign started to come down. The sign bylaw was quite, quite restrictive. But it was an interesting side note was not soon afterwards, people started complaining, how come Vancouver's so dark? How come Vancouver's so boring? Downtown's dead at night. Oh, we don't go down anymore. Well, the problem was it wasn't that anything had changed downtown. It was that we had taken away the light and the color. And I think one of the things about the room here and how it's been designed with the black walls is it allows the neon to really come through. Neon is a great light source, and through the 40s into the 1950s, neon was actually used not only as lights for signs, but it was actually a lighting source for restaurants, department stores, and even houses. And I visited a couple of folks that I knew in Victoria. They had these brilliant Art Deco houses and ceiling coves, and tucked in behind the cove was a white neon tube. There were no other light fixtures in the room. And it's a really great light source. And so I think people like hanging out underneath uh, neon. 
The one thing also that a lot of the critics brought up about neon in the energy crisis of 1970s was, oh my God, all that electricity that it's using. My favorite statistic is a four foot piece of neon plugged in draws less electricity than your television turned off. And so it's an incredibly efficient light source. Now, when you bend a tube and all of the signs that we've seen, the tube comes along and then disappears into uh, the actual can. And so at the end of that is, is what's known as an electrode. And so that's how the electricity comes in, gets excited, and then that gets the gas going and that creates the light that runs through the tube. And so a properly sealed tube, properly bent, is incredibly long lasting. And you can actually, and I have one in my collection from the Vancouver Stock Exchange, bent in the 1930s, and it still lights up. And that came off a building where it had been outside for a num many, many, many years. So it's both incredibly long lasting and it's incredibly energy efficient. And it's also an incredibly friendly light because it doesn't flicker unlike a fluorescent light tube and things like that. And so there's something really attractive about this. So when we did the original exhibition back in uh, 2019, 2000, I made a point of inviting a lot of planners uh, from the city of Vancouver and others down to the exhibit. And I would like to think that we had a little bit of um, influence there because uh, we were demonstrating what the city used to look like and how amazing the exhibition looked and the color and the way neon played uh, that they did entertain and rewrite the sign by off Granville Street. So we have those larger signs now. Surprisingly, Granville Street's much busier and active. And uh, also when the provincial government started buying up some of the old single room occupancy hotels in the downtown east side, they put money aside for heritage and they recreated the historic neon signs that used to be on the buildings. And so we've seen a modest revival in neon within the city. And so we have a couple of really good signs that are hopefully going to come back to Chinatown, fingers crossed on the Ho-Ho and uh, other things. And so we're, we're seeing a small revival um, here in the city. And that's, I think, because the light is so amazing and it's so efficient and you can see it at a great distance and it attracts people like flies. And so that's why you want neon signs in your business districts. So we're going to walk over uh, to another section of the museum. And as we walk over there, you're going to see some photographs on your screen. And uh, the first uh, images are the Ho Ho restaurant in Chinatown. Now, this was one of the great iconic signs in Vancouver. And as the images show, the huge steam that plume that runs up from the bowl uh, would actually flash between English and Chinese, the ho ho and then the Chinese characters. And the sign had pinks and yellows and oranges and greens, and it encompassed the whole facade of the building. And so eventually the ho ho will return to that location, and we've actually designed a new version of the ho ho sign in neon, and so that will come back to the streets eventually. And then, of course, the Lotus Hotel sign is another great example of just a huge sign on a building and with such amazing color and design. And the nice thing is you turn that sign off during the daytime and it reads as a different sign, but it's incredibly readable. And the one thing the sign designers some have forgotten about today is when the lights go out, you still need to see the sign. And so these signs had to live daytime and nighttime, and we don't have that with many new signs today. Anyway, we've moved into the 1950s gallery, and this is where you'll also find a wide range of signs as well. And some of them have been brought into the gallery, such as uh, Ray's TV. And again, the rust has been left in place, and uh, you can also catch the reflections and see uh, different uh, layers to the sign and, and things like that. And the cafe, the Silver Grill, has the outside sign. And then we have the window sign uh, and the uh, window surrounds. And we'll look at that in a second. But what I wanted to do was show you this one. Because of all the signs in the museum, the one that I'm most pleased in many ways came uh, to the museum is Jesus, the light of the world. This was an iconic sign out on Kingsway. And it was there for a very long time. 
it's got some great colors in it because you've got this lovely yellow uh, gold color. So that's blue, that's argon gas going through a yellow tube. And what you would do sometimes is have a yellow colored tube as well as a phosphor inside and then put your gas through and you get some interesting colors. You have the white star with the two blue pieces attached to it. And then this lovely green for the light of the world. Now, when this was hanging on Kingsway, and you could catch it on a day with the sunlight just right, you could actually see that there were three or four different layers on this sign that belonged to a whole bunch of different businesses. And so you can see when you look closely at it, when you're here sometime, the electrode holes have been patched a few times. There's metalwork that's been added, etc. And so while it spent a lot of time as Jesus, the light of the world, it actually advertised other businesses as well. But I'm so happy this one made it to the museum because it's really a great piece of neon. But it's also that iconic Kingsway sign. And to have that lost completely would be quite sad. So we're going to go walk into the Silver Cafe. And this was a uh, typical coffee shop in Vancouver. Uh, and there were many of these, and I think probably the Ovaltine is one of the last remaining that really do match sort of what the silver um, was like. But one of the key things here is the dogwoods in the window. And so many businesses had this window neon and it would sit there and sort of advertise at the street. And all it did was throw color down on the sidewalks. And, you know, you'd imagine a sidewalk um, with rain on it neon reflected onto the, the sidewalk, etc. Now, it's rare to have window neon like this survive because, of course, it gets broken because someone cleans the windows. It gets broken because, unlike a museum where it's protected in its own case, uh, this was exposed and so somebody could uh, just bump into it and, and things like that. Um, but we're lucky to have this window surround here uh, to recreate the cafe. And uh, when you're allowed, in the near future, uh, you should go down to the Ovaltine and uh, grab a cheeseburger because uh, Grace has made some uh, little tweaks to the menu and cheeseburgers are rather good. Coffee's still a bit iffy, but um, actually the good cheeseburger and bad coffee is a nice combination. And the coffee counter is a great space to sit. And you're sitting in a 1940s coffee shop with its window neon and its uh, neon signs out front. So I think we're gonna sit down and uh, take a few questions and try and answer a few of those that you might have. Thank you so much, John, for this very informative tour. Uh, we've had uh, some comments and questions throughout the tour. So I was just waiting uh, for the end of your tour to uh, relay that to you. So first, I just would mm -hmm. like to um, share with you some comments, like people really like the neon sides, obviously, uh, Christy's mm -hmm. I'm doing more than when I visited. Thank you for this opportunity. Um, and also, uh, Norbert is asking, where is the only sign from East Hastings? <laughs> oh, if only we knew. Um, there's a long and complicated and slightly torturous story about the poor old only seahorse. Um, it was taken down and restored, quote unquote, by Neon Products. It was returned to the building and then the ownership of the building changed and we're not exactly sure where the sign went. And so we believe it's in a private collection. Uh, and I would hope at some point we could bring it either down to the museum or out on the street somewhere. Unfortunately, the building itself is going to be demolished uh, shortly. And uh, so we're going to lose the whole uh, site because unfortunately the only cafe itself was remarkably intact as well in the interior, uh, but we're going to lose uh, that building shortly. So unfortunately not a happy answer. Well, thank you so much for uh, your answer. Uh, we've had other questions. Mm -hmm. um, so one of them is, um, I would love to know if anyone has mapped the location of all the neon signs in Vancouver. Uh, yes, um, I have almost done that. Um, way back in the 1980s, a uh, friend of mine and myself, uh, we spent many a night and day 
for months and months and months, walking around the city, photographing neon signs and noting them in a notebook and their location. And then uh, my good friend and colleague, Angus McIntyre and I, uh, we ran from the museum for that original exhibition, we ran a series of neon bus tours. And we thought, and the museum thought we'd run like three or four and then people would lose interest. And uh, I think we ran something like 29 of them. And so Angus and I got pretty good at locating signs. And Angus used to drive a bus for uh, the transit company. I'm out on the streets all the time. And so we'd always be finding new signs. Uh, so Angus and myself have a good mental map of things. And then I have my notebook from the 80s. And uh, I think there's one other. And then for the exhibition, I mapped all the signs that were in the collection, right, wherever they came from and, and their location. So there's kind of a, a bit of a map out there. But it's not something I could sort of pull out of my Thanks. give to somebody yet. Thank you so much. And it's great that you are uh, mentioning these neon bus tours, because one of the questions is, after we get through COVID, are there any neon bus tours planned? <laughs> um, you know what, probably that's, you know, Angus and I talk about it and, and we've, and we have discussed the idea of it. Part of the problem now is that while there are signs out there, sometimes they're just too far apart. We had a really nice route that we, you know, the original tour took something like three and a half hours to do, but we had to stop on Kingsway at Wally's. Uh, for burgers. And um, unfortunately, now Wally's, while there's a new Wally's uh, in a shopping mall, the original drive in has gone. And, you know, we've talked about and looked at could we create a bus tour that made sense? And we're not sure yet because there's too much distance, I think, between some of the signs. But I do think we could do some sort of bus tour of that. And driving down Granville Street, for instance, certainly doing Hastings and things like that. So maybe that's something we can think about again. Um, but we haven't got any concrete plans yet. Well, that's very exciting. Um, we, actually, we have many of questions, but I'm just going to try to relay all of them to you, but I'm not going to uh, time to address all of them. One question from Rachel is um, use of asbestos to make the signs. Is it is this not a health concern? Or back then, I guess they did not realize that it can cause cancer when exposed to it. What safety procedures do you take in using materials? Well, the asbestos um, sheets, they weren't just, um, I mean, I guess one of the key things is, is the core material for it was asbestos, so it wouldn't burn, but it wasn't um, like raw asbestos fiber. And so there was a coating on it and uh, the edges were sealed. And so I've never seen asbestos um, plants that were actually shedding any fiber and things like that. And when they were stored, they were stored in tubes in a file room. So they weren't out and about a lot. Uh, and when they were on the table, when you were actually making the sign, uh, you would really be putting the tube down on it, sitting it there, checking it, lifting it, and going away. You weren't really interacting with anything that would cause the fibers to come off the plans. And so while there's probably a little bit of fiber um, from it, I don't think it presented much of a health hazard. And I've never heard of any sign bender, glass bender, dealing with anything from asbestos. And now there's more modern materials that can take the heat of the, of the tubes and stuff like that. But, you know, even the one that's hanging there, I've handled a, a few of those in the collection um, from the exhibit. And it really feels like very thick paper. So I, I think the health concern is quite minor. Um, we have other questions. Um, is Risty in the collection? Yes, uh, it's, he's just too big to get in the museum. <laughs> so uh, he's over in one of the other storage buildings. And when it was brought to the museum, he hung outside on the outside wall uh, opposite the crab for quite some time. And they're in storage, but the sign is huge. And they didn't, I don't think they could figure out a way of getting it in the building for display, but it is in the collection. 
And another question would be, I don't know if you know the answer, uh, how old is the oldest sign in the museum? I believe the, just from its design, uh, I believe the oldest sign that we have is actually the jewelry uh, store sign, uh, Agnews, uh, because there you actually have a really interesting and old uh, pattern of corrugated, um, corrugated, it's corrugated metal, galvanized uh, steel. Um, it's also got some pressed metal decoration pieces around it. And then it has uh, the diamonds in leaded uh, glass. And so what that says to me is that's a much older light bulb sign that's then been updated with neon. And older signs used to just have light bulbs in place of a tube. And so they'd spell out the letters in light bulbs. And so that one to me um, says that looks pretty old. And I would say that's probably from the 1930s. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. You're so knowledgeable, John. <laughs> um, so we have plenty of other questions. Uh, I sure. would like to mention to all the attendees that if we don't have time to go over all the questions, we're going to make sure we uh, put together all your questions, answer them uh, in a document that we will send out to the attendees yeah. uh, afterwards. Um, so maybe just one or two questions to finish. Uh, mm -hmm. We have a good question. Uh, is it safe to have neon lights in, ho in a home? Any concerns with the safety of the gases? No, not at all. I mean, you could, uh, no, uh, again, you're, you're sitting there breathing every single gas that you see in that's making uh, everything in this room light up. And so it's all distilled from the air. And so there's no safety concern whatsoever. The amount of mercury that was used in a tube, uh, such as the silver grill here, uh, this is all argon gas in the, in the tubes. So even though we've got yellow and white and, and green, uh, there's just a tiny, tiny drop of mercury in there just to get the argon gas to glow in that characteristic blue. And if you were to break the tube, um, uh, you'd be hard pressed to find the mercury on the floor. And that would be really the only hazard of a tube. And modern transformers are really efficient and um, not a hazard. Old transformers, on the other hand, were these massive black boxes. And if you took the lid off, you basically had um, a whole bunch of PCBs in there and things like that. They were, uh, if they leaked and stuff, they could be. Um, but no, I've had, I have had neon lit up the house. Um, I've got a ton of tubes in the basement. I just haven't installed them anywhere. Um, my wife used to have the big um, blue star from uh, one of the businesses down on Hastings Street in her office and lit up and things. So, no, it's perfectly safe. And as I mentioned before, really efficient lighting because uh, it draws so little power. Excellent. Well, that's great because you uh, answered another question at the same time uh, about mercury and argon. So that's pretty good. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, it's great. <laughs> um, and maybe just one last question. Uh, that mm -hmm. we How were the signs acquired after they were lost? Well, that's kind of interesting because, again, one of the key things here is that the sign company owned the signs. And so when, um, well, as, as one of the guys out at Wallace Neon, one of the older companies, uh, they used to call them kill orders. So when a business said, you know what, we're, we're retiring or no, I don't want to renew the lease, then a kill order was issued on the sign and the company would send a crew out and they would take the sign down and bring it back to the yards. And most of the companies had established yards. Um, so Neon Products, for instance, was originally over on Terminal Avenue. Uh, actually, the buildings are still there right at Terminal and Main. But then when they moved out to Clark Drive, they were there for an exceptionally long time. So they just brought stuff into the yard, put it out in the thing and, and left it there. And Wallace did the same thing in other sign companies. So much of the collection the, the, the museum has, the original collection, was collected by a fellow called Ralph Kalman, who's an artist, and a light artist, uh, and I guess a light advocate, as well as an environmentalist. And um, he used to haunt uh, the yards, in particular neon products in the 1970s. And so 
you know, it was basically, yeah, sure, you could have that. And so he collected from neon products a number of these uh, signs, as well as a bunch of glass tubing as well. And so that was the core of the collection that the museum uh, took or got from Ralph. But then one of the really nice things is that the museum has always been proactive. And so they've acquired uh, signs and they have let the sign companies know that, you know, if there's a certain iconic sign out there, um, you know, please consider us, as well as sign companies will sometimes say, hey, we're taking this down. Do you guys want it? And so there is an active kind of collection um, aspect to it. And so from that original collection, which um, we assessed, uh, the former uh, curator here um, of history and myself spent an, oh, an enormous amount of time in the basement uh, looking at signs and glass and where did this come from? What is this, et cetera, um, to determine what the collection was. And then once we had the core collection, uh, we then wrote a document that was, you know, basically we want to have this and this and this, you know, the top collecting list. And so that's been an active collection over the years. So the core of it then comes from Neon Products primarily with a few other companies uh, from their yards and then uh, augmented by donations from uh, companies and things like that, other companies over the years. Well, thank you so much, John. Uh, we're going to wrap up now. There are many okay. other questions but, and comments, but we're going to make sure that we relay that to you and we can give answers to all the attendees afterwards. Um, yeah. I just would like to mention one comment before I wrap up, because I okay. feel it really summarize that. This person is saying, you are super knowledgeable okay. and cool. Power combo. <laughs> so thank you so much. Um, and so before we, uh, uh, we wrap up that uh, webinar, I would like to just give some information about uh, next, uh, the next more virtual tour. So uh, first, we hope you enjoyed the tour today and that you learned uh, something interesting along the way. And so I just would like to share with you a sneak peek uh, of our upcoming more virtual. So next time we will be touring our latest exhibition which is a seat at the table, uh, Chinese immigration in British Columbia. So it's gonna be during Asian Heritage Month. Um, it will be led by uh, local Canadian, uh, Chinese Canadian artist, Paul Wong. And so this tool will give guests uh, personal insight into several of his artworks, uh, which were created for or adapted in this exhibition. And it will also be uh, an opportunity uh, to highlight a few of his favorite historical objects and stories. Um, so the next tour will take place on Tuesday, May 18th at 5.30 p.m. So spread the word, uh, mark your calendars, and we hope to see you there. Uh, and have a good evening, everyone. Bye for now.